Hello and welcome to the 13th session of our Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution Reading Group series. Today we're on to chapter 13, the expansion of production. So we're going to get into what I like to call like communist accumulation, you know, the expansion of the economy. And, you know, to a lot of commies, that sounds kind of a bit, <laughs> for some reason, I think people find it a bit dodgy or something when you start talking about accumulation and expansion of production. But anyway, we're going to hit into it here today. We have part A, the simple reproduction as the starting point. Who wants to read? Alex. Yo. You're back. I am. I was, yeah, my first grandchild was busy being born. That's taken my last few weekends. Ah, oh, so. Alex, that's no excuse. Jesus <laughs> Christ. I think it is, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you ready to hit this one? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. Okay. Chapter 13, The Expansion of Production. Section A, The Simple Reproduction as the Starting Point. However, the adaptation of production to needs brings a separate issue into focus, which we must consider here. It is a matter of expanding old, existing operational units and creating new ones. In other words, it is a matter of expanding the production apparatus or accumulation. This expansion raises various problems for the distribution of the social product, which we have not considered so far. To make it possible to study the laws of the movement of communist operational life, we started from a social situation that will never occur in practice. We assumed that all operational units would produce on the same basis every year. In other words, we assumed that the production apparatus would not be expanded. As a starting point, we assumed that each year only the wear and tear will be compensated and the rest of the social product will be used for consumption. Our example was the following. The total wear and tear of all means of production are 108 million working hours, the raw materials 650 million working hours, and the work of all workers together also 650 million hours. The total product is then F of T plus C of T plus L of T equals the total product, or 108 million plus 650 million plus 650 million equals 1,408 million working hours. This product mass is now distributed to operational units and consumers as follows. One, the productive operational units used for their wear and tear and their new materials, 700 million. Two, public operational units take their wear and tear and their new raw materials. 58 million. Three, consumers use as much as their hours worked, 650 million. The total stock of goods, therefore, is 1,408 million. Note, concerning the stock of goods, we must not only think of material things, it also includes immaterial consumer goods, theatre performances, exhibitions. This reduction is also based on the normal calculation of the consumption of working time. F plus C plus L equals theatre performance. The workers who take part in such a performance can consume it by paying their consumption money, at least as far as this kind of service is not yet covered by taking as needed. Our concept of the stock of goods, therefore, includes the result of all social work. The distribution of the national income to the three groups of consumption we have mentioned, one, two, and three, is not the result of essential bureaucratic apparatus which manages and controls the production apparatus in the social goods, but this distribution comes by itself, since the operational organisations replenish their wear and tear and their raw materials. The same applies to consumption. Since working time is the measure for the distribution of social products, the entire distribution falls outside any politics. As a result, the trade unions have no function under communism. The struggle for the improvement of working conditions is over. The objective course of operational life decides itself how much product is returned to the production system and how much each employee receives for consumption. It is the self-movement of operational life. After we've become aware of this, of what actually happens to the definition of working time as a measure of consumption, we can move on to the question of the expansion of the production apparatus. We must therefore now move away from our provisional assumption that all operational units will continue production on the same basis. An expanding operational unit not only needs to replenish its wear parts and raw materials, but in addition, it needs to absorb more production resources and raw materials. 
Okay, so like in Marx's Capital, where he starts with simple reproduction and then goes on to expand the reproduction, we see the same move here in this. A lot of this is just kind of rehashing of the, the general gist. One thing I think probably we should note, given our ecological point of view at the moment, um, where they talk here about like expansion as a given, I can imagine that they're, you know, we should also kind of envisage like the ability easily for a communist society to decide to reduce output if they want, like in a way that is planned. I think this is a kind of an advantage, particularly for certain industries. I think, you know, in a planned way, it could be very easily done. There is one thing I think here that is it's quite interesting. Alex, you might still... Yeah, it's like, I was about to read that very line. Yeah, about to say that, uh, yeah. A brave conclusion from this section. So this is the the bit where it says, as a result, the trade unions have yeah. no function under communism. The struggle for the improvement of working conditions is over. Okay, so that's kind of like, a, it, it's quite a, I'm saying the word pejorative, but uh, I think that that's not the right word. It's quite a tasty statement. I think that the trade unions would not really have a function. Uh, I don't think, because you're they're not, you know, the, the main function of trade unions under capitalism is to negotiate the wage level and because there is not a wage level you're getting the full product of your of your work the trade unions would not have that function but i can imagine like the 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 function of worker safety and stuff shifts into the guilds but i uh, or the actual factory itself but not trade union what do people, Alex, you have thoughts on I mean, that? I, was going to say, I mean, there's surely going to be some representatives who are going to neg- negotiate with working conditions, even if not pay. Yeah, I think within like the, yeah, I think that's, so I I, I just think the function would be would be quite different. I think it would more be like well, a it's, it's workers' council. trade unions now. But you, yeah, but to say they've had no function, uh, I think well, I think they would. I think they would kind of, you know, unless we, depending on the trajectory of the revolution and how it would mm-hmm. organize, like, would the trade unions be a, a massive point of organization, like in Spain, like the CNT? Is it more the party? Is it a combination of both? Like, yeah. you could imagine the trade union as an organization could morph. But I think the 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 point at which, let's say, for example, how a guild would decide on the type of machinery that's going to be used in a steel mill you know that would be decided primarily by the guild and the factories themselves as opposed to an external body that's the way i think it's implied the trade union is kind of morphed into a guild hasn't it in the sense of the yeah it's kind of dis- okay. it's kind of dissembled like they would they would they would you know the, the council communists would see the trade unions as very different than the workers councils yeah like that's that's the kind of point we should make um yeah. But I was going to say, surely the struggle for the improvement of working conditions is not over. No, no, not over at all. But just the the organisation. So, so that course is wrong. I think you could say. Well, well, like the organisational form. Literally, the second clause in that sentence. The struggle. Improvement of working conditions is over. I'd say that's just incorrect. Uh, Come on, you can do it. Yeah, uh, I know. It, it, it's probably slightly over the top. Is the way I'd put it. But I know what they're getting at. That's the way I'd say it. Uh, <laughs> okay, so there's, a, so there's an imaginary other statement that is correct. That, no, like I like I said, like they're they're not opposed. The trade union we're not they're not they're not negotiating with another body for their safety for for their working conditions. You know, like literally, they they decide themselves their working conditions. They decide themselves the new types of technologies or or stuff that they want to implement. That there is not an opposing body. That their trade union is used as a kind of mediation between the owners and the workers themselves. The workers themselves aren't struggling with themselves to do it. You know, they're, they're deciding it. I think that's the sense in which it's meant. Kielce? I was going to make a similar point, because that's pretty much what he does in the next chapter. He comes pretty hard for trade unions in Soviet Russia. And it, it, it's exactly as you said. But um, I, I was wondering... Um, what the overlap was between all these different terms, I'm not familiar with them very well. Um, obviously, workers' councils kind of make sense to me, and trade unions as a, as a negotiating body with the employer. But you've got other types of trade unions as well, like in, in anarchist Spain, where you had more syndicalist trade unions. Is that the same thing? And then you've got guilds as well. So do they fit in? Uh, is a guild overlap with a workers' council, or would those be two separate things? Well, I'm using guild in the sense that he uses it for in communism as opposed to guilds under capitalism or feudalism. So the idea of 
say all the shoe factories together as a guild deciding their their production where to put new means of production and all that kind of stuff so i'm using guild in that in that sense i think the way he he's talking about trade unions here is primarily how trade unions have acted under capitalism particularly like in germany and that the trade unions were i don't think they were very on the left of the spd i think they tended to be on the right of the spd and you know would look for improved conditions but not being radical as opposed to the workers councils which were like a kind of a revolutionary body were direct control not controlled by a bureaucracy i think that's the sense in which he's using trade union there uh, herman might be able to correct me if i'm wrong there let's head on to the next section the expansion of production is always at the expense of consumption who wants to read this part randy The expansion of production is always at the expense of consumption. However, the above production plan shows that the goods required for the extension of the apparatus are not available. The entire social product has already been consumed. Therefore, it is necessary to make additional efforts for the expansion. For example, the working time would have to be extended by five hours per week, which would then be used exclusively for the expansion of the operational unit. In other words, we cannot exploit the full yield of our work, but must save part of it. The expansion of the operational unit is therefore always at the expense of social consumption. The speed of the expansion of operational units will, therefore, be one of the main points of discussion under communism since this speed determines the length of the working day, or in other words, this speed determines how much product is left for consumption. It now depends on how this reduction in consumption is achieved and how these costs for the expansion of the operational units can be determined. Yeah, so the general point here is the expansion of the operational unit therefore is always at the expense of social consumption a very easy kind of fundamental point to understand if you're if you want to expand it you've got to, to save some of the output of production for the expansion that you can't consume and it will also change the distribution of the output you know some things that are used for the production expansion of production machines and stuff aren't consumption goods so not only will it change your level of consumption but also it'll change the distribution of production so it's kind of a, a two point thing we were talking a little bit about degrowth in certain sectors before how do we think degrowth would i guess affect the amount of consumption because obviously uh, like like do you think that it would be a little bit like expansion where in the process of degrowth you're have you have to use some of the production for that process or would degrowth allow more consumption for that period of time that's a good question like uh, like if you think about like what degrowth could mean degrowth could literally mean like you know what happens under capitalism sometimes where it's just things go idle they rot and they they go off oh, true. It, yeah like it, it could be that it could be that you you just produce less means of production going forward you know there's probably a whole series of in, of interlocking dynamics that could happen it could be just be starting to degrowth very specific types of of stuff and that means the production may not be any good again so like it could be waste there could be shifted towards other parts i i think in practice that would be quite a complex interaction kilcher had his hand up interesting to see how this develops um does it, what he's describing with this sort of growth process is sort of analogous with capitalism, sort of organic capitalist growth, where, where you know, a, a, a business's growth is self-funded as opposed to being, um, you, you know, you borrow or injected with, with, with fresh capital from outside of a business, which is also another way of growing in a, in a new market. But it's interesting that he's not exploring that. And I'm wondering if that's, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering why that will turn out to be, but it would be the same for, for degrowth as well. You could fund it from the business itself or you could fund it from the general pool of, of, of surplus and both are seem viable it's a it ought to be a debate about which is desirable in any situation so expand on that there a bit Kilcher. like what do you mean like that the say the guild or the factories themselves could hold and not pay the workers at that point of production to generate it or that it would come from a general pool is that what do you what are you trying I'm to tease out there saying overall that you there are, there are plenty of situations where it'd be desirable to cross subsidize production of a of a, of a, of a good or an, a new um because of a new, a new process or a new, a new system um, and you, you you do that out of by by basically 
<laughs> increasing the cost of consumption for other goods and other services uh, in order to subsidize something that uh, specified as particularly important. Uh, let's consider, say, there's suddenly a market for, for for needles so that people can be injected with, I don't know, vaccines or something. So do you do you fund that by increasing the cost of, of or, you know, the needles that you've currently got? No, probably not. It's an emergency. You want to fund that through other through other mechanisms. But I mean, that, that seems reasonable. I mean, I, I think there's... there's It'd be interesting to look at the analogs across this whole system because I suspect there's there's quite a few of them with, with capitalism which which has similar problems. Yeah, like I think the general the general gist is always not to do a price policy, but to do it from uh, like the FIC calculation that the the rate of taxation, you know, and that 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 what what if you want to subsidize certain things like well well like would it be a general social work unit or would it be something else like would it be in a, a, a consumption good? Is usually the demarcation. I would say that I think that's at the level of where it would probably go. You know, could there be r- rationing of certain things? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of rambling. Um, maybe something we'll hit on later. Let's see if we can bring it back up a, a bit when we get through this, Kilcha. Maybe it'll. Maybe I'll have some thoughts. <laughs> Will we try part C? C. The general rule for the expansion of the operational unit. The general rule, which applies in Russia and in Soviet Hungary, is that the prices of the products are set so high that the operational units make enough profit to be able to carry out the expansions. Direct and indirect taxes also contribute to this. Russia is an excellent example of how operational life is not influenced by the decisions of the workers themselves, but is entirely in the hands of the ruling bureaucratic caste. As far as we have already looked at this method of price policy in dealing with general social work, we do not need to go into it again now. But how does the Association of Free and Equal Producers find a solution to the problem of accumulation? This solution is determined by the essential task of the social proletarian revolution. According to our, and we say Marxist, conception, the real task of the proletarian revolution is the implementation of generally valid rules according to which producers and consumers organize production and distribution themselves independently. As far as production is concerned, we have established as a general rule that all operational organizations should calculate the production time of their product. As far as the consumption is concerned, we have established as a general rule that the working time will be the measure of consumption. Since the management of the operational unit is a function of the producers themselves, the third general rule to be added is a fixed rule for the extension of the operational unit. With the implementation of these rules, all producers will participate in the production process under the same economic conditions and will thus become equal producers. If we now take a closer look at the general rule on the expansion of operational units, it should be noted at the outset that we are not primarily guided by economic but by political considerations when dealing with this issue. The solution to all of the problems of the communist economy must be dealt with from the point of view that the workers themselves have control over the economy. Certainly, there can often enough be a contradiction between this independent administration and more rational production. In such cases, we work less rationally and then accept a slower development of operational life. If we deviate from our demand for independent management, a bureaucratic caste will soon take over the management of the operational units, which will soon move to what they consider to be a more just distribution of national income. This is why the question of the expansion of the operational units must also be dealt with from the point of view of independent management. To transfer the needs of the workers directly to production, it was necessary to link consumer organizations directly to production. This also means, however, that operational organizations must be able to expand their operations if this is necessary to meet needs. They should, therefore, have the right to expand their stocks. The transformation of social relations, therefore, leads to new legal relationships in this area, too. However, the expansion of the operational unit cannot take place arbitrarily, as in this case there can be no question of a social production system. The General Congress of Works Councils will, therefore, have to set a certain general standard within which the expansion must take place. For example, Congress can stipulate that the operational unit must not be expanded by more than 10% of the means of production and raw materials. This simple decision will then regulate the entire economic life as far as the expansion of operational units is concerned, without the producers becoming dependent on a central economic authority. Every operational organization now knows exactly how far it can go without disturbing the social calculations of productions. Okay, so again, they're looking at, say, uh, they start off with looking at what happens in Russia and Soviet Hungary. And they set the prices of products so high that the operational units make enough profit to carry out expansion. So there's a, a price policy underway here. 
Okay, so this book goes very much against the price policy. So they talk much more about like a an, an income tax type way of funding stuff, because that keeps the rational that keeps the rationality of the system in 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 the in the sense that people can actually see the labor time that's in the price. They see the price. They know what it means, and that it it allows people to understand and de-fetishize the commodity kind of form of capitalism where it's like when the price is delinked from the labor time it it allows people to consider the value in the object themselves and not in the social relations and the labor that has gone into it okay so he goes into this bit here the real task of the proletarian revolution is the implementation of generally valid rules according to which producers and consumers organize production and distribution themselves independently as far as production is concerned, we have established as a general rule that all operational organizations should calculate their time, the production time of their product. That's the first one. Calculation of production time. Rule general rule number one. As far as consumption is concerned, we've established a general rule that working time would be the measure of consumption. That's rule number two. You know, you get paid for the labor time that you work. That's your consumption is based on labor time. Since the management of the operational unit is a function of the producers themselves, the third general rule to be added is a fixed rule for the extension of the operational unit. With the implementation of these rules, all producers will participate in the production process under the same economic conditions and thus will become equal producers. Okay, so the third general rule is a fixed rule for the extension of the operational unit. Now, does anybody have any thoughts on this? This is, like, again, this is that point that everybody can expand by a certain amount. We have targets set, you know, for the economy as a whole. We're going to do increase our gross communist product by 3% this year. Everybody can produce, can increase their production by 3%. Randy? So I think it sounds awesome. But one thing I'm not totally sure about is how, like, who actually is responsible for creating that fixed rule? Or like the actual amount of expansion is what I mean. Is it in this chapter where he points to like a economic congress? So basically, the higher levels of abstraction from the workers' councils, some kind of I think you know kind of federated. Yeah. Okay. I think it's on the next page where it's talking about the general congress of work works councils will therefore be the one yeah. to set the expansion. Okay. Yeah. I guess I just need to get a better understanding of the work councils. Alex. Yeah, I just want to check I'm understanding this third rule correctly. So, I, 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 as I read it, I don't think it's saying you you can produce 10% more shoes in a year, but you can spend 10% of your, I don't know, whatever you spend on improving productivity. Well, a 10% expansion, I, it seems to be saying a, an extension of the operational unit so, like that extension might in increase production by more than the right, yes, three yeah. percent. So the the ten percent constraint isn't the a constraint on the amount of stuff you make; it's a constraint yes. on the amount you spend on increasing stuff. Exactly, it's not yeah. a physicalist yeah. extension; it's right. a, a labor time sorry, yeah, so means production it was extension. Physicalist, yeah, uh, okay, yeah. Uh, that makes more sense. Cool, Alan. Should we interpret this as like a mandate to expand by that percent? Or is it just you may, you know, an operational unit may at its discretion go up to that percent? And if they don't go up to it, then is there slack in our calculations? Yeah, I think we, we, we're we going to meet it a little bit more. Like they're, they're not very, very clear. I think there's like a little bit of kind of teasing out what is being said here, to be honest, in this general rule stuff. But they they make further on. We'll see how they'll say like you know people might say well we have enough shoes as society. The workers say yeah, Grant, we don't want to expand our production. We're going to give our three percent of expansion like labor time goods. We're going to allow you know the council house building program to take our three percent to help them expand more fastly because we need we need more houses or something. You know, so they do get into some of that. I think it's just like a a general target. That you're not allowed to go over as a individual production unit. That's the way they say it. Essentially, later on, you know, in, in this section, they're they're reasonably vague on how the interaction. You know, reasonably, they're quite vague on how this interactions would all go on. 
they're just letting setting down the kind of fundamental <laughs> principle. Let's just read this little section here. It should be noted at the outset that we are not primarily guided by economic, but by political consideration. Okay, so this is this is a secondary point. I think is really fucking important. To be honest with you, okay, let's read this. It should be noted at the outset that we are not primarily guided by economic, but by political considerations when dealing with this issue. The solution to all the problems of the communist economy must be dealt with from the point of view that the workers themselves have control over the economy. Certainly, there can often enough be a contradiction between this independent administration and more rational production. In such cases, we work less rationally and then accept a slower development of operational life. What do people think about this? You know, this is the age-old discussion of expediency over what would we call a principle. Kielce. Uh, yeah, and I see what I see what they're saying um, in terms of like uh, the self-management of, of, of operational units. And I guess that's what independent means in this case. What I'd be interested to, to have looked at more, and he's not, and I can see why it gets messy, is is how the different operational units interact with each other, because there's certainly a case in a, in a lot of situations where you could you could see you could see them being pushed into situations where they're competing with each other, or certainly there's a competition for resources to make a new operational unit instead of expanding an existing one. So there's all these niches where where a sort of bureaucracy can creep in, and, and I, I see so many places where this this could you could end up with new elites forming in different ways in, in the corners of such a system. Yeah, I think like there, 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 there won't be an end to politics, you know, like fundamentally there won't be an end to politics, but the design of the system should be able to dampen the worst, the worst kind of stuff we see. Like literally the next sentence says, if we deviate from our demand for independent management, a bureaucratic caste will soon take over the management of operational units, which will soon move to what they consider to be a more just distribution of income. But like getting to what Kielce is saying here, it is undoubtedly people's willingness to like be the seen as the leader of a large industrial plant or whatever, their ego will get into the wanting to like expand their own production. I think that that kind of stuff would be undoubtedly be the way that say people would uh, a way that people would seek. Not a form of hierarchy, but a, a a form of you know a kind of a careerism. You could imagine that taking place, but again, like because they're democratically controlled and there are no exploitation wages, the wages are the same for everybody. You know, it, it seems like a way that could, you know, if there's a battle between like people having one large one or two smaller firms in some district, you know, I think if we could replace like all the shithousery of capitalism with that kind of a battle. We'd be pretty damn happy. Okay, let's see. What's this next bit here? Um, to, to transfer the needs of workers directly to production, it was necessary to link consumer organizations directly to production. This also means, however, that operational organizations must be able to expand their operations if this is necessary to meet needs. They should therefore have the right to expand their stocks. The transformation of social relations therefore leads to new legal relations in this area too. So I think this gets into a very kind of a kind of a cybernetic kind of replacement of a market whereby, you know, the tight links between the consumer and the production organizations will lead to, you know, that relationship leading to a quite a lot of independence of the production organizations to control their production outputs. What do people think about that? It says here that it, it, it can't be arbitrary, it has to be make take take place within limits. But you know, even if like if 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 consumer tastes change so much in a in a time period, say you have a one year ten percent target, and say like there's a craze for a certain kids' toy or something, and production needs to ramp up to two hundred percent, four or five hundred percent to meet needs. Like it seems to be that like I I think that in reality this this idea of a just a simple ten percent target, I think that would be quite restrictive in practice. I think that there would be with new, you know, with our information technology systems, cybernetic approach, I think that it, it would be a lot more flexible in, in reality. Am I alone on thinking that? What do people think? Alex? No, I agree with you. I mean, not just for the like new toy, but, you know, to, to like counter, you know, huge inequality within 
a country, you're going to need your know, units in some regions expanding more than in those, uh, uh, I'd imagine. Yeah, but more so, like I can imagine that could be handled within this situation if people like say, oh, they could transfer their, you know, like one workers' council or guild says, oh, we're grand, we have no shoes and they can transfer it. But I mean, just more in a dynamic sense, you know, like I feel like that there's probably lots of dynamic stuff happening. Donal. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think probably a lot of this, uh, I imagine, would be handled at the level of the guild as well. Not really, as it's talking about here, maybe at the level of the the individual workplace, because, I mean, everything is cooperative in this thing. You know, the prices are formed through a average social production time. Obviously, the, the actual production effort is cooperative and distributed between firms. So, yeah, I mean, I think it would be, as you say, it, it lends itself more to a sort of some kind of cooperative or cybernetic principle and not so much to an individual firm expanding, like having the complete independence to just, you know, randomly expand it, its capacity or its stock whenever uh, the need arises. That's how I see it. You could imagine, like, say, a firm that does have to rapidly ramp up production for some reason or other, that they do so uh, as they kind of need to. And like the kind of planning or guilds and stuff will be able to see if if the system itself can take it. You know, that will this we need an extra 15 tons of coal tan. Can we accommodate that? You know, and, and that kind of stuff. I think that those kinds of kind of built in kind of reactive stuff will take the place of hard limits. Well, I think it would be they would have much less of a place, these hard limits in a system that would be designed with today's technology than would have been designed, say, with the technology of the 1920s or 30s. Alex? Well, I think there's two things. I mean, there's the, the, the increase in like, the operational units and then there's wrapping up production of particular things. And that's more commonly switching production rather than you know, building you know, a dozen factories. You know, like, like the, the Second World War, you know, the states didn't build a plane, well, they built plane factories as well, but they just, you know, took all the car factories and said, right, you're now building planes. Yeah, like, and I think yeah. those type of big scale... But you, you can small stuff, like, like, you know, the example you gave of a toy that becomes massively fashionable, then toy making factories will just switch to make that toy. They won't build new factories. So it's not an increase in the operational unit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like, let's say if you did, let's say though, if you had a, an overall increase in, say, toys consumption. Yeah, but that's not going to be more than 10%, is it? Yeah, no, I'm just, we're just yeah. talking, you know, in the abstract, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, but yes, I think that certainly for stuff like you're saying there, like, like that shifting of switching of production. Yeah. Okay, Alan. Uh, this may be opening up a bit of a can of worms, but like on the topic of these micro changes and what we're thinking of as consumer taste one could imagine maybe not having to deal with that in all cases in terms of social labor. If we think about like, you know, 3D printing and yeah, obviously not everything falls into that, but maybe domestic production for lack of a better term, if we have individual consumption, maybe there can be individual production according to, you know, I can make my own custom version of this or that garment or something. I download, you know, patterns and run it through my computerized sewing machine and, do, and make my own clothes, that kind of thing. And that would be outside any of these uh, uh, labor hour calculations because it would fall under my individual consumption for the raw materials and, and the machine and all that. Oh, you're a dirty libertarian. No, it's true. Yeah, no, I think that stuff's cool. Like there was, I remember about 10 years ago, I came across this thing. Don't know if anybody's ever heard of it. I think it was called the Rep Wrap Project, where you basically, you can build yourself a 3D printer out of components and the the goal was for a printer that could print itself and then it could print other stuff so that you you, you could decentralize production into the home patrick says rep wrap is, is still going yeah like I, I do like the idea of being able to print uh, kind of micro circuits and stuff like that that would be cool kilcha now that we're sort of expanding our horizons um it, it's always worth talking about and considering the possibility that once you have a, a communist system that a lot of the a lot of the, the things which push us to to follow fashion closely those stimulus are, are relaxed slightly it'd be interesting to see how much people still want to have the latest toy for their kid or how much jamie how much influence jamie oliver still has in, in such a different society 
I'm looking for a post Jamie Oliver communism. That's 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 what I'm heading for. No, I, I think it, it's definitely true. But I also could could imagine, say, for example, we see in revolutionary times there is massive increases in creativity that we might actually find that well, like the concept of the brand, I think will be will 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 disappear. But you know, we could see like a a vast increase in the number of products that people want to use and consume when there isn't the kind of a homogenizing. Uh, advertising unit pumping out what is like the standard kind of consumption norms for for people so i could imagine we could have a a blossoming of, of stuff here yeah that could be could have big implications perhaps for uh how things are produced okay who wants to read this next section any hands alan here this simple decision will then regulate the entire economic life as far as the expansion of the operational units is concerned, without the producers becoming dependent on a central economic authority. Every operational organization now knows exactly how far it can go without disturbing the social calculation of production. If we look at the example of the shoe factory already used, production is calculated as follows. F plus C plus L equals 40,000 pairs of shoes, 1,250 working hours plus 61,250 working hours plus 62,500 working hours equals 125,000 working hours. This is an average of 3.125 hours per pair. The operational unit now has 10% of the production equipment and raw materials available for the expansion of the plant, i.e. 10% of 62,500 corresponds to 6,250 working hours. The following year, an amount of 62,500 plus 6,250 working hours appears in the accounts of the operational unit and in those of the general social accounts under the heading taken from society. If all the operational units now use their rights, they are all increased by 10%, which means that the entire production system has been increased by 10%. This is the production comparison for the current year. FT plus CT plus LT equals total production. Then it will be for the next year, 1.1 times FT plus CT plus LT equals total production. D, the application of the general rule. Such a decision, for example, to provide for a general extension of a maximum of 10% aims only to regulate production and consumption in broad terms in order to determine broadly how much product can be withdrawn from consumption without causing a disturbance. The sole purpose of this is to ensure the mobility of operational units so that producers can actually adapt production to their needs. It is clear, however, that not every operational organization will have to exercise its right to expand its activities, as several sectors will be able to meet all requests. On the other hand, there are other industries, housing, food industry, that are still far from being able to meet their needs for the time being. Such industries require a far greater expansion than 10% of the consumption of production means and raw materials. However, they must not go beyond the general requirements, as this could lead to supply problems. However, it is quite possible that, especially in the initial phase, several operational units will transfer their right of expansion to such needy industries, thus providing them with a larger expansion fund. In any case, it is essential that the operational organizations ensure that they have the right to extend if this is necessary to meet demand. On this basis, many organizational forms are possible, which ensure a regular production flow. How the economic principle is organized can only be solved through practice. It depends on the circumstances in which the working class comes to power and on the type of operational units. The organization of the operational life, and especially a rational production, are not at the beginning of the revolution, but take shape in the process of development. The revolution destroys the old social relations and creates new laws of movement for the movement of goods. The organizational social control of operational life grows with the new laws of movement. The organizations are constantly changing manifestations in which the general social basis is reflected again and again. So do people get this, the, the general gist? So we're looking here at the example where basically 10% of the output, if you want to expand your production this year, essentially you have to have a larger fund for the next year, 10%. So what does that mean in general? It means that the amount that, that goes to the labor fund will be reduced by that amount. So this is essentially like, so it's this denial of consumption for expansion. The general rule then, the application of the general rule, 
So here he gets into this idea of how different it's interesting here it's like on the other hand there are other industries housing food industry they're still far from being able to meet their needs for the time being right today the food industry i think we say to say that in like developed countries absolutely overproduces what is necessary but housing <laughs> not so much you know so it, it's kind of interesting to see that what has been solved by capitalism over the years but he makes the case that operational units that we're talking about earlier can transfer funds to power through larger expansions in different areas. They also say, like, getting to the, like, a criticism people have of the book that it doesn't write out exactly what everything should be, how it should happen. This Congress should talk to that workers' council and this should happen and the planners should look at this and that and the other. Like, here's what they're trying to say here about how this should evolve how the economic principle is organized can only be solved through practice it depends on the circumstances in which the working class comes to power and on the type of operational units the organization of the operational life and especially a rational production are not at the beginning of the revolution but take shape in the process of development the revolution destroys the old social relations and creates new laws of movement for the movement of goods the organizational social control of operational life grows with the new laws of movement. The organizations are constantly changing manifestations in which the general social basis is reflected again and again. What do people think about this section? Randy. So I think especially since we keep coming back to, you know, like energy infrastructure and the transformation and stuff, I think it's really awesome that they are really like talking about how the organization will have to meet the needs of the people during you know during and after the revolution like it's so dependent on the time and place that you can't just have like you can have the broad laws that they laid out before but the actual specifics of it i think if they had if they had tried to provide specifics of it that are just focused on growth i think a lot of them could be useless to us whenever we're also you know having to focus on other things you know so i think it's i think it it might be a criticism of the book but i actually think that it makes the book more accessible to us now yeah, I kind of think it's a strength of the book, to be honest with you, that it hones in precisely on what these fundamental principles should be and less on, you know, councils upon councils upon councils and how this committee talks it out. I think it's it brings clarity to the whole whole idea of communism. That's the brilliance of it. Kielce. I I I agree with all of that, although I've got some caveats and concerns that, that I wish he would address, which is that when he sets out laws um, but doesn't say sort of like how you know how we'll actually sort of set up organizations to apply those laws that what that works well because you've got basically pressures being brought to bear that that naturally will resolve themselves through 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 mediation of these different organizations but in this particular case it's not clear to me how those laws would encourage the cooperation to sort of turbocharge growth um, in, in particular sectors within it. What is going to encourage a, a shoe factory to surrender some of its organizational capacity so that more houses can be built? Eh? It sounds really messy and like there'll be a lot of sort of really nasty sort of ne negotiation and polit politics that like we were talking before, but not under girded by any particular pressures for that to work in the same way that some of some of the other some of the other parts of this of this of, the, of this process would be and yet capitalism does solve this problem and that's that's why it concerns me because capitalism that would you know um, would raise prices in all of these areas that would encourage more investment and and i'm not seeing that that sort of same underlying set of laws to, to help in that process yet so give me an example give an example of a firm and we can see if we can tease it out so you mean a a firm where, where 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 this particular set of circumstances wouldn't help in in, in terms no, of no no just I mean just say give us a kind of a, a test case scenario and see if we can like discuss how the the system itself would okay help so, to so, regulate it. so you want to build houses you need steel um, and perhaps I don't know uh, you also need steel to make cars and then both of them we don't have enough of them so how do you how do you I mean, organize which you've got a factory that makes cars and you've got a, a factory that's making materials for making houses and um how do you mediate the discussion on like which one you need to you need to turbocharge the growth of it's 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 not clear to me there's that there's, a, there's a way to resolve that situation that's, that would scale okay so like I, I think like because we have the the fundamental link between production and consumption things that we do have an idea for 
consumption levels and they tend to be like on 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 a lot of goods tend to be quite quite flat or they'll have trends so like say for example you want to increase say you need 50 new trucks to build this you know new block of flats or something the area that you're going to you you want to build say or the channel tunnels let's say you're building another channel tunnel hey, you're building boris johnson's bridge to fucking belfast right from strand rare okay like let's say you're 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 doing that like and let's say you you calculate uh, as they do they literally actually the i think the british government have done a report on it and they calculate like whether they can actually harness the economy to get all the resources to build this thing so like you could say that for example we we will actually need you know 10,000 new trucks okay and currently we're producing only 50,000 a year that's 10,000 extra trucks you need to build now the the truck plant might actually have capacity they may not you know so society if it's a big enough thing i think society might have to decide to push more expansion towards say the truck thing or not but that that ha- that kind of large scale implementation of like new expansion of production under capitalism a lot of times is pretty planned you know it is planned through the corporations themselves they do plan their growth so i don't see why you could not uh, plan the growth i think if you're getting towards the idea of like the workers in the truck companies or whatever or truck f- factories they have to you know now produce you know 20 percent more goods well then i think you could we, that would naturally see like either people want more consumption they'll work longer hours or a shift of uh workers towards those i i, I i'm not so sure if it'll be as nasty as you think it, it will be somebody alex has a hand up but i think somebody put up before alex first let's go with alex and whoever else it was yeah, it's done all before me yeah i'm, I'm wondering how much of a problem this is because I, I mean i I don't think you actually need, you know, um, your factories to donate the excess. You know, I think a lot of them just won't use it. So, I mean, under capitalism, I'm pretty much forced, you know, to expand uh, production to, like, you know, buy new machinery and you know, the, the latest techniques or whatever. Otherwise, my stuff would be more expensive compared to the competition. Don't really have that constraint, I don't think. So, I mean, you may have some... You know, some factories who are like dead keen on I- increasing their factory, but some people be like, "Yeah, we can just carry on as we are. That's you know, why not?" So I, I think a lot of places just wouldn't. You would go, "Oh yeah, you you, you can't spend five percent increase in your factory." But I think a lot of people go, "Ah, you know what? We're fine." Yeah, I think if the produ- if the like, I think I, I would could imagine a lot of the actual increases in productivity will come at the point of literally of replacing means of production with new means of production yeah. and not a rush to outcompete others. I exactly, think that would yes. be the, the natural evolution of the society, to be honest. So I, I think it's a really good point. Donald. Yeah, so just on the on the specific thing that was brought up, one thought, and I was talking to you about this before, Tom, um, one thought I had was in terms of if you had, it, or if the society had a kind of strategic choice to make, what you could do, would be to create some kind of tools that at least make those choices easier. So one thing I was thinking of was this like idea of a uh, product labor capacity maps. And basically the idea would be kind of simple enough in the sense that you have everything in this economy being priced in integrated labor time. So what you would be able to do is to have, if you're familiar with the idea of an input output table, so you have input output tables for every product linked through the economy. And so you would be able to see, you know, if we did build uh, a thousand trucks, uh, what would be the extra requirement uh, we would need for steel and uh, fuel and more trucks and so on. And you'd be able to, you know, like a visual representation of an input output table. Like those kind of tools would at least allow the industries to be able to see, you know, okay, you know, we can make kind of uh, some kind of rational decisions here. So yeah, that's just, just a thought. Oh, I'm sold. I want that video game. It's very, very interesting, yeah. Because like, like you could have literally a request put in by a certain a, a request put in for this new bunch of massive shift of production, say whatever, and then you can actually look at your input output tables and then just see what all of this would mean for all of the different sectors. And you could see that well, this sector would need to be increased by four percent, this one by two percent, this one by eleven percent, and then society can use that to, to basically 
plan that. So I, I I think that it's a it's a really great idea. I think then it was Slavic. Yeah. Uh, so again, you have a bunch of poor countries with undeveloped means of production, or the production isn't evenly developed across the world. So what I guess are there incentives or anything for poor places to basically catch catch up? I think what was pointed out earlier was, well, you know, areas that already have like a well-developed means of production, they may not want to, I guess, donate any of their labor to improving the production in areas that the uh, operational unit isn't particularly productive to to catch up, basically. And so what, what would be the incentives to, uh, I guess, get everything evenly developed across the globe? Good question. I think that there is probably a couple of things there. I, I think even even the idea of a non-exploitive wage would bring up the what could be consumed in the poorer parts amazingly because they'll have the same consumption capability as those in the developed parts. So there's that. But also, I think with respect to productivity, you know, we have to assume they're in the same, you know, logical area you know they're the same communist we'll call it country just for ease of term but area or whatever that the the guild so if you have like a mattress producer or a shoe producer in the poor unproductive area when they join that guild they will be the first to receive funds to increase their productivity at that point like the aim of all the guilds will be to bring up all of the factories within the guild to the same productivity levels I think that's kind of like would have to be a, a very core component of the guild system. So that's how I would imagine it. Like I know there was all manner of problems, as particularly like I think in like I remember listening to some long uh, series of stuff on the Yugoslavian experiment that there was that was a very major problem. No doubt <laughs> with your name Slavic Dreams, <laughs> you're probably aware of uh, of some of that stuff. But like that was definitely the case for like places in like I think that were further developed, like Croatia having to subsidize backward places, backwards productive places like Montenegro and places like that. I think that was a huge bone of contention that allowed really helped in the carving up of Yugoslavia from a single entity in the nineties. Try section E then. Who would like to read this section? Patrick. Kielcha, were you, you putting your hand up? <laughs> yes, I was. E, the influence on the payout factor. We have already seen above that, in our opinion, the costs of expanding the operational units cannot be recovered through profits of the units, i.e. through any kind of indirect taxation. The basis for the transports of goods is and remains the socially average production time of the products. The reduction of consumption can, therefore, not be found by way of price policy, but must be achieved by a direct reduction in consumption. How much does each worker have to contribute to this expansion of the operational unit? For those who have carefully followed our considerations on the payout factor, the solution is very simple. For the total production, we have assumed F plus C plus L equals total production. 108 million working hours plus 650 million working hours plus 650 million working hours. The cost of the plant expansion is now 10% of F and C. 10% of 758 million working hours equal to 75.8 million working hours. This amount must be paid by all employees together so that 75.8 divided by 650 is 0.12 of their consumption. According to our calculation, the payout factor without operational expansion was 0.83. This is now 0.83 minus 0.12, which equals 0.71 with operational expansion. So for a working week of 40 hours, everyone receives 0.71 times 40, which is 28.4 hours of consumption. F, special accumulation. In addition to the usual accumulation, we will also look at the special operational expansion. By this, we mean the realization of larger works 
that will take several years, such as the construction of bridges and railways, the completion of transport routes, the construction of seawalls, the reclamation of wasteland, etc. These works usually take several years. Such activities also reduce the quantity of the product for individual consumption. As long as, for example, a railway is being built, all kinds of tools and raw materials are used. But for the time being, no new product will replace them. Moreover, the workers who work on it are taken out of normal production. So they too consume, but do not return any products during these years. This kind of expansion of production absorbs a significant proportion of the social product, from which it follows that an important part of the discussions at the economic congresses of the workers' councils must deal with the questions of to what extent these works should be initiated and which ones are the most urgent. The higher the productivity of the work process, the easier we can satisfy our needs respectively realize the special accumulation on a larger scale. If we conceive society as being not capitalistic, but communistic, there will be no money capital at all in the first place, not the disguises cloaking the transactions arising on account of it. The question then comes down to the need of society to calculate beforehand how much labor, means of production, and means of subsistence it can invest without detriment in such lines of business as, for instance, the building of railways, which do not furnish any means of production or subsistence, nor produce any useful effect for a long time, a year or more, while they extract labor, means of production, and means of subsistence from the total annual production. In capitalist society, however, great disturbances may and must constantly occur. On the one hand, pressure is brought to bear on the money market, while on the other, an easy money market calls such enterprises into being en masse, thus creating the very circumstances which later give rise to pressure on the money market. Pressure is brought to bear on the money market since large advances of money capital are constantly needed here for long periods of time. And this, regardless of the fact that industrialists and merchants throw the money capital necessary to carry on their business into speculative railway schemes, etc., and make it good by borrowing in the money market. This is uh, Karl Marx, Capital Volume 2, Chapter 16. Therefore, if it seems desirable to build a new railway, a budget must first be drawn up stating how much social product, how many working hours, this will take up in total and over how many years it will be distributed. The character of this work is that it belongs to the type public, i.e. it burdens the budget for general social work, GSW. Although this reduces the payout factor, the costs of such an expansion of the operational unit are borne by society as a whole without breaking the link from the producer to the social product. Once the product has been completed, it can be transferred to the administration and management of the operational organization, which will now carry out the normal operational calculation. In this way, it can be transferred to the productive type of operation, for example, if required. Okay, so that's very interesting. So like the idea, like society makes these decisions based on like these big ideas that we want to build a railway here or some sea defenses here or reforestation over here or or whatever the hell it may be and like society is is taking a huge amount of stuff out of basically consumption for a long time but like once once the actual railway or whatever is built and during that time it essentially operates as a general social works unit yeah it's like a hospital or whatever it's just getting all the funds it needs to do itself and and sometimes these things will actually transfer perhaps back into a a productive unit like say a railway could actually go if if we were you had to pay money to use the trains in their communism money say use your, your use your labor hours your consumption funds under communism then it would actually go into a productive unit so they can depending on what it is it would could switch during the building period from a GSW unit into a productive operational unit so i think that's quite elegant okay and and we saw earlier just in the earlier bit about how the accumulation fund affects your factor of individual consumption payout does anybody have any problems with that calculation do people understand it like instead of say for example you getting 32 hours of your 40 hour week for consumption after you paid for your hospital your roles yourself now that you want to expand production this year you're actually going to reduce it to maybe only 28 hours you get 
okay, so that next year our consumption will be higher, but you have to pay for it this year with lower consumption. Doesn't that mean you're punishing the people in expanding sectors? What do you mean by that? Are these people work 40 hours, but they only get... they get they No, get everybody. Left. That's everybody. Uh, it's the entire society because it's, it's a general tax. Oops, sorry. I misread it as being just for the operational unit. Okay, we'll, we'll hit the last little bit because we've talked about some of this on the way through the through the day. Do you want to just pick the very last little bit that kills you, the general fund? G, the general fund. Finally, we would like to point out a circumstance that also influences the payout factor. This is the need for society to stockpile various products in order to be able to provide support in the event of natural or technical disasters. We are thinking here of major floods, hurricanes, peat fires, etc., where the victims are dependent on the help of a private charity. Under communism, this type of hardship will have to be borne by the whole of society, so it is natural that a general fund should be set up with the help of the payout factor. The speed with which this stockpiling is carried out is in the hands of the councils, which must determine the amount of this fund at the Congresses. So this part is particularly kind of galling, considering what happened with COVID, isn't it? Like the idea of like, was it the was it the English government, the British government? They they sold all their PPE, their personal protection, you know, for the nurses and stuff, off to China. <laughs> I thought they were making making bank, and then it came back to bite them in the ass. And Trump, I think, closed a lot of the stuff for the that Obama had set up for pandemic preparation. Preparation, yeah, and even Obama made a total mess of, even Obama, my God, Obama made a total mess of, I don't know if people heard about that, there was like some, wasn't there a kind of a, they put a whole load of money behind creating cheap ventilators, where they wanted to have like a thousand dollar ventilator, and did anybody hear about that scandal? Yeah, I heard about that. I I think it was something... Like, so there was going to be money put into developing it. And basically it was, I I don't remember exactly, but I think it was like, they basically retracted the effort to make a a cheap, affordable ventilator. So what happened? There wasn't a market for it at the time. I'm not sure. No, I think what happened was that they they put it out to kind of tender and these like companies started developing them. And then what happened is the ventilator went in and bought out the developers oh, yeah and then they right. sh- and then they shut them down yeah. be- because their ones were 10 grand and they didn't want to lose money so like you know there's some incredible like market bullshit going on there but i think this gets to a, a kind of a deep point i think that is important for managing any kind of society as well is just a general kind of in, in mmt they call them buffer stocks i think that's kind of a general kind of economic term for them but general buffer stocks of of important types of outputs you know whether that is food you know technical equipment and even to the extent of just even large amounts of redundancy in the system where a capacity can be pumped up quickly in key areas i think that that would be a very important thing for communism to to get away from this idea of just in time delivery to the extent whereby a small deviations from the plan cause you know systemic crisis anybody have any final thoughts then on today on accumulation what do people think about how the chapter deals with accumulation as a whole do people like the idea of commie accumulation some some people, when you talk about communist accumulation, it, it makes them think that the value form is back to work. Kielce. I, I think it didn't really pang together for me, but the, what's really interesting for me is neither really does microeconomics when, when studying sort of similar, trying to, try, trying to create models is hard. Yeah, so I, I feel like it's part of the problem here is trying to describe something that doesn't exist. It's inevitably going to gonna gonna look unrealistic. And, and I think it's just part of like it being such a, such a huge change that it's very hard to describe it in a way that, that that's easy to, to digest. I think they make a good case for how accumulation can be done in a planned fashion and how the accumulation itself is not a thing that is done behind the backs of the capitalists and the workers themselves by the social relations and the value form. That the accumulation is a decided upon target, say, in, in their 
in in, in how that they have uh, proposed it here. Not that it would have to stick precisely to those to that formulation, but that the targets and all those things are themselves rationally chosen by the people. I think that's a big thing that people get worried about when you start talking about communist accumulation that you you feel like it's a you're talking about a runaway freight train of capitalist accumulation but i think they do a, a good case uh, any final thoughts in here before we wrap off for today okay we'll take for next next week we'll do chapter 14 we'll do section 1 the control of operating life all the way from 228 to 248 Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, sure, I'll talk to you next week.